Hello everyone, a very good morning and welcome to Baiju's exam prep. Welcome to the daily Hindu news analysis. Before we begin today's discussion, we have a couple of important announcements. Today, that is on the 6th of January, we shall be conducting a very important workshop. If you are preparing for the UPSC exam, if you want to know how to approach the upcoming prelims examination, do attend this workshop without fail. The workshop will be held on the Baiju's exam prep app. It will be conducted by Abhishek Mishra sir. All you have to do is register by using the link provided in the description box below. And also, as we have been reminding you, we have started one-on-one -on -one counseling for UPSC aspirants. If you want to understand how to approach your, how to plan your preparation for this examination, you can get in touch with our counselors. All you have to do is fill a Google form, which has been shared in the pinned comment and in the description box below and provide your details and our counselors will get in touch with you. So with this, let's begin with the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper. Today, I have taken the international edition of The Hindu instead of the regular Delhi edition. Because in the international edition of The Hindu, which is a new feature introduced by Hindu, there are some very important and interesting articles today. I have chosen a total of nine articles out of which we will conduct a thorough detailed analysis of two important articles and we have seven other important articles that are relevant for the prelims examination. So let's cover these topics one by one. And if you guys are liking the initiative, all you have to do is support us by pressing the like button and by subscribing to our channel. And also don't forget, do head to our telegram channel after the session ends because we have a quiz on these topics after the Hindu analysis. It helps you revise these articles again. So do join the telegram channel. Again, you can find the link in the description box below. So let's start with this important editorial on page number six that is very relevant for GS paper three. This editorial deals with the topic of antimicrobial resistance, which is popularly abbreviated as AMR. The editorial is of the view that antimicrobial resistance, which is becoming an emerging concern in the healthcare sector, it could negate all the advances that we have made in the field of medicine. That is the viewpoint of the editorial. The editorial is expressing concern about the misuse of antimicrobials, especially antibiotics, how it is contributing to the emergence of so-called superbugs or the rise of antimicrobial resistance, which could become a larger healthcare crisis as it will negate the advances that we have made in the field of medicine. So this is the core argument being made by the article. Now let's understand this in detail. Let's understand what exactly is antimicrobial resistance. How does this develop? What factors contribute to it? And what measures have to be taken to deal with this emerging crisis? And to substantiate the argument, we'll need some data as well to back up our argument. So we'll look at some important reports that the editorial is referring to and take some important statistics from there to highlight the concerns related to antimicrobial resistance. Antimicrobial resistance is essentially the mutation of pathogens, the mutation of various disease causing microbes, which essentially makes them resistant to most of the drugs that are available to treat the diseases caused by them. Now, when we say pathogens or microbes, which are disease causing pathogens, I'm referring to various bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites, etc. Many of these pathogens, they can cause diseases in human beings, in animals as well. And due to advances in medicine, we have come out with antimicrobials. For example, we have antibiotics that gives us protection against bacterial infections, that helps us fight bacterial infections. We have antivirals, specific antivirals for certain strains of viruses. Similarly, antifungals, antiparasitics, etc. So all these drugs, these medicines, which have been developed through years and years and decades and decades of research, they fall under the category of antimicrobials. Essentially, this is our first line of defense to protect us from the deadly diseases, many of which could be life-threatening. 
This is the first line of defense that we have. One reason why life expectancy has gone up in the last few decades, in the last century, is because of these advances. Because of the development of antibiotics, antivirals and other antimicrobials. But there is a concern which is emerging. Very soon these antimicrobials may not be effective. It may no longer be the line of defense against these parasites. Why? Because we have overused and abused these antimicrobials which has exposed all the pathogens quite frequently to these antimicrobials. See, naturally, any bacteria, virus, they mutate. It's a natural part of evolution. But as these pathogens are more frequently exposed to the antimicrobials that we have, they start mutating at a faster rate. They develop a degree of immunity against these antimicrobials. This is what we call the rise of superbugs. Bugs which are resistant to your powerful antibiotics and antimicrobials. So if this occurs on a large scale, essentially it's as good as we retreating back several decades or even a couple of centuries with regard to the advances we have made in medicine. Imagine someday if most antibiotics become ineffective, if antivirals become ineffective because the bacteria, the viruses, they have mutated, they have adapted to the antimicrobials as they have been overexposed to it. So this is already a concern, it's an emerging crisis. We've already seen certain strains of bacteria and viruses which have developed this resistance against few specific antimicrobials. Now, let me tell you why this is a concern. This is a major concern because according to the WHO, the World Health Organization, more than 1.27 million deaths in 2019 were directly attributed to rising bacterial antimicrobial resistance as different strains of bacteria have become immune to the available line of drugs, the available line of antibiotics that we used to treat. As a result of this, almost 1.27 million deaths have been directly attributed to this condition. Indirectly, it is responsible for around 4.95 million deaths as of 2019. And this concern keeps on increasing. Now, especially the pandemic, which caused a lot of scare as well. It pushed doctors to be more precaution, more cautionary. Patients became more vulnerable and they started buying the drugs available in the market. They would self-prescribe drugs to themselves, which has led to essentially overuse and abuse of antibiotics and various antimicrobials. So today the concern is even more serious and this has been well established in a recent report. In fact, that is why this editorial has been brought out. Recently, the National Center for Disease Control, which is under the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, conducted one of the first All India survey to understand the extent of antibiotic usage in the country, to understand the patterns with regard to antibiotic usage in the country. And this survey presents some alarming facts. The survey has pointed out that more than 70% of patients in tertiary care who would have ad undergone advanced surgeries, major surgeries, who are receiving advanced tertiary care, they have been prescribed antibiotics, more than 70% of them. For example, a cardiac surgery, those who have undergone organ transplantation, those who are undergoing cancer treatment. It's often a line of treatment as far as doctors are concerned in order to protect the patient from any possible infections, especially bacterial infections, they will prescribe a dosage of a course of high dose antibiotics and more than 70% of those patients who have undergone such surgeries who are in tertiary care have been prescribed with antibiotics. Now, this seems to be the correct line of treatment, right? What's wrong in putting patients who have undergone surgeries, major serious surgeries on antibiotics? It helps protect them against infections, right? That is the argument, correct? But let me tell you where the concern arises. The survey shows that in more than 50% of the cases where antibiotics were prescribed, there has been a potential to cause antimicrobial resistance. Meaning, it would expose the pathogens unnecessarily to the antimicrobials, allows them to mutate more and at a faster rate, which will lead them to develop 
a degree of resistance against the antimicrobials. In majority of the cases, the prescribed antibiotics were not even specific to certain bacteria. Even in case of proven bacterial infection, majority of the patients who have been put on antibiotics as a prophylactic treatment, as a preventive treatment, the cause was never clearly identified. In the diagnosis stage, doctors without even identifying that it's a bacterial infection, they often put patients on antibiotics. Because this is seen as prophylactic care, meaning preventive care. As they say, prevention is better than cure. Instead of waiting for the infection, doctors put the patients on preventive treatment. This is where the abuse occurs. Without even an actual infection, without even identifying the bacterial strain and giving specific line of antibiotics, if general and high powerful antibiotics are prescribed to a large percentage of the patients, that is what leads to overexposure where the microbes are exposed enough to mutate and develop resistance against the basic drugs that we have. Look at the data. Only 45% of those who are prescribed antibiotics, only in 45% of the cases, they actually had infections. Meaning in rest of the 55% of the cases, they had no infections. They were still given antibiotics as a preventive care. Out of these 45% who actually had bacterial infections, the strain was not identified. Only 6% of the patients received specific antibiotics for the specific strains of bacteria to specifically target that bacteria. Which means in majority of the cases, this is guesswork. It's largely preventive treatment or extreme precaution being exercised which is leading to over-prescription of antimicrobials, especially antibiotics. And also, Patients, especially in countries like India, in developing nations, underdeveloped countries where drugs are not very strictly regulated, they tend to self-prescribe. I'm sure many of us would have done this. In our families, we would have seen family members doing it. The moment they get any symptoms, the moment they get slight fever, headache, or runny nose and cough, right? Instead of going to the doctor, we run to the pharmacy. And even though the pharmacist is not supposed to sell Drugs which are meant only for prescription, right? They sell it as over-the-counter drugs and we take antibiotics on our own, right? In every house, I'm sure there will be a, a self-claimed expert. Either by learning through the internet or by consulting with a local pharmacist. We all have this habit in general at a societal level where we take antibiotics on our own and we don't even complete the entire course. In case of any antimicrobial, it's very important to complete the entire course. The moment symptoms die down, we often stop taking the antibiotics. So this abuse of antimicrobials by the patients themselves, the poor regulation of the medical industry, the, the distribution of drugs has added to the problem. So on one hand, in the healthcare industry, doctors are being overcautious. Even without identifying a bacterial infection or identifying a specific strain, they are putting most patients on antimicrobials just as a preventive treatment, which is already overexposing the pathogens to the available line of drugs. On the other hand, the government is not regulating the drugs being sold by the pharmacists. Prescription only drugs are being sold as over the counter drugs. And we patients have a habit of self prescribing medication to ourselves without consulting a professional doctor. So all these issues are contributing to rising incidents of antimicrobial resistance. So the editorial says that if we don't address this as a major health crisis, this will set us back with regard to our scientific development and the progress that we have made in the field of medicine. Because we will reach a point eventually where we won't be able to tackle these basic infections as well as our available line of antimicrobials will become useless. They'll become ineffective. If we lose the line of defense that we have created through these various drugs, right, then automatically it increases the risk to human life. The mortality rates will shoot up. Especially patients who undergo major surgeries where there could be complications, right, they will be at greater risk if superbugs become a much bigger problem. There is excessive usage and abuse of 
antibiotics and antimicrobials in the animal husbandry industry in order to increase the yield of milk and meat and to protect the cattle and the birds in the animal husbandry industry they are administered very high doses and strong doses of antibiotics and antimicrobials this is another major factor there is large scale abuse of antibiotics happening in the animal husbandry industry which is not being checked by the government so that is why the editorial is of the view that it's very very important to curb these practices to place restrictions regulations on the abuse and misuse of antibiotics in animal husbandry industry to place restrictions on the selling of drugs by the pharmacists to work with the healthcare professionals the doctors to ensure that there is no overusage or over prescription of such antimicrobials and more importantly awareness has to be spread amongst the people amongst the patients to not self medicate if we don't address this as a healthcare challenge as a healthcare crisis we will reach a point where we are going to invalidate all the gains that modern medicine has made it's as good as going back in time by 150 200 years essentially your available line of antibiotics antivirals will become useless and ineffective against these emerging superbugs so the way forward is one the doctors have to be more cautious with regard to the drugs they are prescribing in the name of prophylactic preventive treatment they should not put every patient on antimicrobials when it is not necessary when the infection has not even been identified in certain cases yes when serious major surgeries have happened to protect the patient from infections yes prophylactic treatment would be necessary but this shouldn't become the norm it should be an exception so doctors the medical industry the healthcare industry in general has to develop a better code a better standard to ensure that any prescription of antibiotics antimicrobials is rational it's done on the basis of facts scientific facts next there should be strict regulation of the usage of antimicrobials especially in animal husbandry industry where it is being abused for promoting growth apart from growth hormones antibiotics are being administered on a large scale in the animal husbandry industry which is a major concern this is being done to increased yield to increase productivity but this has a major healthcare consequence apart from that we need to accelerate research and development in the pharma industry we can't sit and wait for the existing line of drugs to go ineffective we have to work on new drug candidates develop the next line of antibiotics antivirals which can deal with superbugs as well we need to accelerate the research development process and ensure that there is equitable access affordable access to the new line of treatment which becomes available in the future so this is where the government the healthcare industry the pharma industry plays a critical role there should be strict regulation to prevent the overuse and abuse of these antimicrobials so the responsibility lies on the doctors the healthcare industry the government and of course the patients as well we all need to be more responsible to understand the risk and ensure that we don't overuse and abuse antibiotics and antimicrobials so that is the core argument being made by the editorial and you can definitely expect a mains question on this now let's move on to another important article from page number 5 in this article a european scholar a very popular professor from europe akil bilgrami you can see him in this image here he has delivered a lecture in chennai and the debate was on the issue of secularism the topic of secularism and akil bilgrami who is a noted constitutional expert a legal expert he has said that secularism in india is exactly the same as secularism in europe now as upsc aspirants i'm sure you would have studied indian polity at least a part of it you would have come across the concept of secularism and most of you would know that most experts argue that indian secularism is distinct from western form of secularism but here an expert is saying that there is no difference indian secularism is exactly the same as european secularism so on what basis is he making this argument that's what we need to understand we should understand what is secularism 
what kind of secularism we find in India, how does it compare with Western secularism and what is the argument of the eminent professor. So let's take a look at this. So secularism, if you look at it as a constitutional ideology, as a political so constitutional ideology, it's about separating religion from state. If you look at the origin of the concept of secularism, the Western origin, the European origin, it's about separation of state from the church, keeping the state separate from religion, ensuring that there is no religious interference in the state in matters of governance and administration, and there is no state's interference in matters of faith. This separation between religion and state essentially is seen as the modern concept of secularism. But however, the concept of secularism predates this. Even prior to the modern Western secularism that came up, there has been a version of secularism practiced in Indian civilization since ancient times all the way till medieval modern times. That's why many experts argue, historians, legal, constitutional experts, they argue that secularism has been an inherent feature of Indian civilization. Because secularism is also about neutrality of the state towards all faiths, ensuring that one majority religion doesn't discriminate against minority religions, ensuring that there is tolerance towards different faiths and beliefs, ensuring that there is respect and equal treatment of all faiths. Now, this is something which has been intrinsic to Indian civilization since the ancient times. Now, if you look at the core tenets of Hinduism, the core tenets, the core philosophy of Sanatana Dharma, look at the Vedas, the Upanishads, they all promote Hinduism as a way of life. You look at all the non-Abrahamic faiths, including Hinduism, if you look at, let's say, Jainism, Buddhism, which took root in the ancient Indian civilization, they all display a very high degree of tolerance. They do not project a rigid version of religion. It promotes respect and equal treatment towards all faiths, all beliefs. This is a classic feature of the non-Abrahamic faiths that took root in the Indian civilization. Later, when the Abrahamic faiths entered India, be it Islam, Christianity and others, they've all been assimilated and a unique diverse Indian culture came up as a result of this mixture. If you look at even in medieval times, if you look at the various socio-religious movements, be it the Sufi movement, the Bhakti movement, be it under the Mughals, especially under Akbar, right? There are several examples of secularism being inherent to the Indian civilization. From ancient India, the Vedas and the Upanishads, to Buddhism, teachings of Jainism as well, they all promote a view towards maintaining tolerance towards different faiths, different communities, and maintaining that equal respect towards each other, irrespective of the size of the community. So, in Indian civilization, at a societal level, there has been a tendency to not encourage majoritarianism, where it's not the rule of the majority, the dominance of the majority. Even minorities have been treated with equal respect. So, various faiths have blended into the Indian civilization. That is what adds to the diversity of the Indian civilization and the beauty of Indian culture. As I told you, in medieval times as well, be it a Hindu ruler or a Mughal ruler, there have been various examples to highlight communal harmony, tolerance between different faiths. Of course, there would be aberrations here and there, communal hotspots here and there. But by and large, the Indian civilization since ancient to modern times has been inherently secular. Where the state has largely not targeted the minorities, where minority faiths have been allowed to flourish in parallel with the majority religions. As I told you, Akbar forbade for forcible religious conversions, abolished religious taxes such as jizya. If you look at Dini Ilai, it contained both components of Hinduism and Islam. Look at Sikhism, another non-Abrahamic faith. Right? Look at the teachings of Guru Nanak Dev. All these faiths 
be it non abrahamic or abrahamic eventually in india within the indian subcontinent they acquired a secular tendency where there was respect towards each other tolerance towards each other now if you look at western concept of secularism the modern western concept of secularism which is of more recent origin in europe scholars thinkers they called for a clear separation of the state from religion because at one point the church was playing a critical role in administration in matters of governance in interfering with the powers of the monarchy the monarchy was heavily influenced and controlled by the church in europe until one point so as the renaissance happened modern liberal thoughts came up the french revolution took place several thinkers scholars philosophers they came out with new ideas the concept of secularism took root in the west in europe and as thomas jefferson says secularism according to him according to the western standards is about a clear separation between church and state this was seen as absolutely essential to ensure that we live in a free society where state is not enforcing a faith a religion where state is not interfering with religious matters or the other way around where religious institutions are not interfering with the state so in europe it was seen as essential to separate completely create a distinction between the state and the church and that has been the western concept of secularism so from a indian perspective this is seen as a negative concept of secularism where the state has been asked to not get involved in any religious matter and religion has been completely separated from state so this complete distinction between state and religion which is a western concept is seen as a negative concept a negative connotation of secularism the very term secularism was coined by british reformer jacob holyoke in 1851 and even he described secularism on similar lines so the concept of secularism that evolved across britain france and especially across western europe in the 1800s 1900s uh, to the 20 21st century it's all based about separation of church from the state whereas if you look at secularism in modern india it has taken a very different connotation it has taken on a positive connotation which is rooted in indian civilizational heritage secularism in modern india is not just about separation of religion from state where state does not discriminate on the lines of religion which is called as dharma nirpekshata it's also about sarva dharma sambhava where there is equal respect given by the state to all faiths to all religions it, it essentially means through the indian constitution our founding fathers have established the tenet of secularism which is inbuilt into our constitutional provisions be it in fundamental rights directive principles of state policy these provisions have been ingrained the very concept of secularism right has been borrowed from indian civilization borrowed from partly from european concept as well and a customized blend has been infused into the indian constitution where the state is asked or rather prohibited from discriminating on the lines of religion treating all faiths equally respecting all faiths treating all faiths equally preventing the rise of majoritarianism this is inherent to the indian constitution now some of you might argue that sir the word secular was never added into the original indian constitution you are absolutely right the term secular was added much later in 1976 during the emergency period under the then indira gandhi government through the controversial 42nd amendment act constitutional amendment act that's when the word secular was added into the preamble since then india became not just a sovereign democratic republic but a socialist secular democratic republic so that is when the word secular was added but doesn't mean that indian constitution did not have secular features if you have studied fundamental rights under part 3 if you have studied dpsps under part 4 and even fundamental duties under part 4a you will clearly come across the inherent secular features of the indian constitution the constitution framers led by dr ambedkar they had introduced several provisions you look at right to equality under article 14 15 and 
आर्टिकल फोर्टीन प्रोमिस इक्वालिटी बिफोर लॉ इक्वल प्रोटेक्शन ऑफ लॉस टू एवरी वन टू एवरी सिटीजन आर्टिकल फिफ्टीन प्रोहिबिट्स द स्टेट फ्रॉम एनी काइंड ऑफ डिस्क्रिमिनेशन ऑन द ग्राउंड ऑफ रिलीजन द स्टेट कैन नॉट डिस्क्रिमिनेट ऑन द ग्राउंड ऑफ रिलीजन आर्टिकल सिक्सटीन प्रोहिबिट सच डिस्क्रिमिनेशन इन टर्म्स ऑफ एम्प्लॉयमेंट इन मैटर्स ऑफ पब्लिक एम्प्लॉयमेंट नाउ टेक द सिविल सर्विस एग्जाम फॉर एग्जाम्पल राइट द एग्जाम दट ऑल ऑफ यू आर प्रिपेयरिंग फॉर doesn't matter whether you are a hindu you are a muslim or a christian or a jain irrespective of your faith or of your religion you all get equal treatment in matters of public employment then look at the fundamental rights related to freedom of religion from article 25 to article 29 it provides freedom of conscience to follow your faith to practice to propagate your religion and minority communities minority religious communities their cultural educational rights are guaranteed and protected and allows the state to support minority religious institutions as well which means the state is getting involved in religious matters to uplift some of the religious minorities but this is not a mistreatment it's not it's not a case where the state is favoring one faith over the other one religion over the other it's about treating all religions equally respecting all religions equally and ensuring that the state does not discriminate on the grounds of religion so these features are inherently built into the indian constitution and this was explicitly brought out when the term secular was added through the 42nd constitutional amendment act is that clear so now if you draw a comparison here between western and indian secularism of course there are differences that's why indian historians indian legal and constitutional experts have always argued that indian version of secularism always has a positive connotation to it because it's not creating that strict distinction between state and religion rather it is encouraging the state to treat all religions equally to provide assistance to other faiths as well if required to ensure that there is equal treatment equal respect for all religions so the indian model of secularism is indeed distinct from the western model of secularism now let me substantiate this let me give you some examples as well see in india several social evils related to religious orthodoxy has been banned by the state for example sati killing dowry child marriage such social evils orthodox religious practices including the mistreatment of dalits these practices have been explicitly prohibited by the state so that is a example of state interfering in certain religious matters where it is needed on the other hand the indian state provides support to certain religious activities take for example organizing the hajj pilgrimage the kumbh mela right or in developing religious sites in administering managing various religious sites be it the various boards the waqf boards the department of religious endowments where state governments play a role in administering the the trustee boards that look after temples churches etc there is a degree of state involvement is that clear so it's not that in india there is a clear separation of the state from religion it is a positive involvement where the state is encouraging all faiths equally in some way or the other in administration of the sacred sites in development of the pilgrimage sites in enabling sacred pilgrimages right take for example the kailash manasarovar yatra it's organized by the ministry of external affairs right look at the chardham yatra being promoted and developed the kumbh mela right various uh important fest being organized for the christian community various events related to sikhism being promoted by the indian state or the usage of buddhism as a soft power tool in our diplomacy so there is a involvement of indian state in matters of religion but it's a positive involvement so there are two things to remember here one indian state does not discriminate on the grounds of religion it's prohibited by the constitution itself second indian state can actively promote all faiths to ensure that all faiths get equal treatment so this is where indian version of secularism becomes distinct from western model of secularism 
as Western secularism has always been premised of the fact that state and religion have to be separate entirely. There should be no interaction between them at all. So how come Akhil Bilgrami is saying that Indian secularism, Western secularism is the same? His argument is that, see, secularism is based on three principles according to him. This is his view. He says that secularism is built on three commitments. One is freedom of religion. That is, you can practice any faith you want, any religion you want. Next, constitutional guarantees to protect your freedom of religion. In the constitution, there should be guarantees where state is prevented from any kind of discrimination on religious grounds. And a degree of protection should be given where you can freely, you know, practice and propagate your religion. So that is the second commitment. The third commitment is about when there is a clash between the first and the second. The second one must always prevail, meaning constitutional protection for secularism should prevail at any cost. So if these three commitments are there, then according to Akhil Bilgrami, this is secularism, constitutional secularism. So he says in this regard, Indian secularism is the same as Western secularism. He's saying that when we say that Indian state accepts all religions, even promotes all religions equally. He says that is not secularism, that is pluralism. He says we are getting confused about secularism and pluralism. He's saying that when Indian state equally supports and encourages all faiths, where there is a positive connotation of secularism in India, he says that is not secularism exactly. He says that is a concept of pluralism, where the government is promoting the diversity in the country, in the society working with different faiths. That is pluralism, not secularism. That's his argument. So this is the argument of one scholar. But in our understanding, from India's perspective, based on eminent scholars and thinkers and experts, Western and Indian secularism inherently are different. They are distinct. As we saw, there is a clear distinction between the two versions of secularism. So this is what we take away from this article. And it brings to an end the discussion on all the big articles in today's newspaper. Now let us head towards the prelim section. We have seven important articles. Let's take a look one by one. On page number one and even on page number 13, there is an article related to the emerging crisis in the Arabian Sea, Red Sea region. As we've been discussing over the last few weeks, a major concern has come up in the Red Sea near the Gulf of Aden, near Horn of Africa. This is Horn of Africa. And also in parts of Arabian Sea. In this map, you can see a strategic choke point over here. This narrow opening that connects Red Sea with Gulf of Aden, which is Babel Mandeb Strait. This narrow strait is a strategic choke point. Because it's very narrow, it can be easily blocked. And this is a vital shipping lane that connects Europe with Asia. It connects Mediterranean Sea with the Indian Ocean. So for trade, be it oil supplies and exports and imports, this trading route or shipping route is absolutely critical. As Hamas carried out the brutal attack against Israel on October 7th and Israel retaliated by declaring war against Hamas. And as the Gaza war escalated, from across West Asia, several extremist groups have supported the Palestinian cause and they have tried targeting Israel, like Hezbollah from Lebanon and especially the Houthis from Yemen. These groups, be it Houthis or even Hamas and Hezbollah, they are all backed by Iran as part of its covert proxy war against Israel. So as the Gaza war began, Houthis have unleashed an attack targeting Israel. Israeli ships and even other ships passing through this region, mainly to exert pressure and to push Israel back from the Gaza conflict where innocent Palestinians are being killed. These Houthi attacks which have increased has posed a big concern for shipping in the region. Houthis have used drones and even ballistic missiles. And clearly there is evidence of Iranian support. And Houthis have been using these drones and missiles to target ships passing through Red Sea, through Babel, Mandeb Strait and even in the Arabian Sea. Recently, a ship that was headed towards India, which was carrying oil from West Asia to Mangalore, was hit by a drone 
which originated from this region, very close to India's exclusive economic zone. Many other ships which have no connection to Israel, even they have been hijacked, they have been hit by drones and missiles. And on board these ships, there are many Indian sailors. Because Indians play a big role in global shipping. Right? So this has become a major concern. It has destabilized the shipping route. It has increased the cost of transportation, the cost of insurance. Because ships are forced to take a longer route because of the crisis. Ships are being diverted away from Suez Canal and they are moving across Africa. Moving around the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa and then reaching Indian Ocean. Which is a very long circuitous route. So the duration has gone up. The turnaround time of ships and containers has gone up. This has a global domino effect. Along with this, recently there was another threat near Horn of Africa where, as a, where a container ship apparently was being hijacked by armed men. A group of armed men boarded a ship called Lila Norfolk and immediately a distress message was sent by the ship. There is a, a joint platform in this region to tackle piracy because the same region is affected by piracy as well. You can see here in the map in Horn of Africa region, there is Somalia, where Somalian pirates have threatened shipping across this region from Gulf of Aden to Horn of Africa. Uh, in the last 20-30 years, Somalian piracy has been a threat. There is a radical terror group called Al-Shabaab that controls most of Somalia and it uses piracy as a way to raise funds. So Somalian pirates have been targeting ships, commercial ships and extracting ransoms for many years. So there is a coalition of countries which have deployed their navies here to counter piracy in this region. Countering piracy in this region has been a priority for several navies including the Indian Navy. And there is a platform under the United Kingdom which is uh, the UK Maritime Trade Operations. Under the leadership of United Kingdom the UK Maritime Trade Operations has been set up which is like a portal that receives any distress requests, requests from ships which are being targeted in this region. Once the request is received it is conveyed to all the navies deployed here and one of them will try to assist these ships. So there is US Navy, Italian Navy, the, even the French, the Spanish, you know, China, Japan, right? All the major navies of the world are deployed here. Many of them even have naval bases in this small country called Djibouti, including China. In this country called Djibouti near Babel Mandeb Strait, many foreign naval bases are present. Japan, US, China, they, they all have naval bases here. So Indian Navy as well has been constantly participating in these counter-piracy or anti-piracy missions, at least in the last 20 years. So when this recent request came up, when this container ship was apparently targeted by armed men, Immediately, the Indian Navy responded to the emerging crisis and it deployed its assets on a maritime mission. It dispatched the P-8I Poseidon aircraft, which were procured from the US, which is incredible as far as its maritime reconnaissance capabilities is concerned. The P-8I Poseidon, built by Boeing, is also known for its anti-submarine warfare capabilities. It's one of the major aircrafts procured by the Indian Navy from the United States. So P-8I Poseidon was deployed to fly over the ship, monitor the situation and immediately INS Chennai was diverted to render assistance. And after analyzing the situation, a team of Marine Commandos, Marcos, Marcos are the elite special force of the Indian Navy. Just like Indian Army has Para-SF, the Para Commandos, the Indian Navy has a special force called Marcos, Marine Commandos who specialize in marine special operations. So Mar Marcos boarded the ship and they sanitized the whole ship and diffused the situation. They didn't find the armed men. They had abandoned the ship by then. But they have rescued the crew, which included several Indian nationals as well. So Indian Navy has said the quick deployment of the aircraft and the Indian naval ship, it scared the hijackers and they ran away as a forceful warning was issued to the pirates. They have abandoned and ran away and it has been secured by the Indian Navy. So it's important to highlight and understand this role of India in stabilizing this region which is a vital trading route for India as well. As of now it's not clear whether the hijackers were Somalian pirates or Houthi rebels. That, is not <coughs> that aspect is still not clear. 
because they weren't apprehended they ran away as soon as they saw the indian navy approaching the hijacked ship but it does highlight the role of india in ensuring maritime security across this region even beyond our exclusive economic zone but the other concern here is the rising shipping cost and insurance cost as the risk increases insurance premium will shoot up and this adds to the cost the cost of commodities it's already having a spillover effect domino effect because right now ships are delayed as they are taking a longer route across africa right and along with that the increased premium cost will lead to overall increase in commodity cost which is a result of you know the logistics involved in imports and exports the transportation cost shoots up and this translates into higher commodity prices be it oil prices and even other essential commodities which are being traded so this is something that really concerns india india's commerce ministry is closely looking at the situation if required it may even come out with a subsidy for uh, ships headed towards india to compensate for the increased insurance premium and insurance premium here in this case will be very high which translates to a big increase in commodity prices that are being imported and exported so the government might step in with some kind of financial support if required to bring down the cost on the shipping companies so this is what we understand from this important development next on page number 1 there is a article related to india's gdp the nso national statistical office has estimated that the indian economy is going to grow by 7.3% in this fiscal in financial year 23 24 the indian economy is expected to register a, a phenomenal growth of 7.3% this would make india one of the fastest growing emerging economies in the world at a time when the global economy is staring at a crisis china as you know is staring at a deflation a deflationary situation a housing market crisis but the indian economy remains a bright spot and the nso estimates that our gdp would hit 7.3% in this fiscal so here you should know some basic facts about the national statistical office there could be a problems question the national statistical office was established recently in 2019 by merging the central statistics office with the national sample survey office is that clear previously we had national sample survey office which would conduct several surveys household surveys including the national family health survey it would collect data on key indicators and it was playing a critical role these statistics would play a key role the survey data would play a key role in policy making the cso on the other hand the central statistics office under the ministry of statistics would come out with the national statistics like gdp numbers the state level uh, gross domestic product capital uh, formation right on important national accounts cso would bring out the statistics so in 2019 these two were merged to form the national statistical office or the nso so nso now is under the ministry of statistics and program implementation this ministry deals with statistics as well like gdp numbers and other key economic indicators it also deals with program implementation so under the statistics division there is nso which conducts the surveys being previously done by nsso the household surveys and it also works on key statistics on key national accounts including gdp number so please read more about the nso please understand what is its mandate what is its role you can expect such factual direct questions on such important institutions next on page 13 we have an article referring to the pmi the purchasing managers index it's a very important economic indicator it's even referred to as the leading indicator it's popularly called the leading indicator because it provides you a future perspective of the economic situation this index is designed to measure the level of purchasing which is happening in industries be it in manufacturing or in services is that clear in manufacturing and services sector lot of raw materials are procured or purchased by the companies the factories etc for example to make Uh, appliance to make a automobile lot of equipment components spare parts raw material has to be purchased right 
So whatever purchase order a company is placing for the coming month, that gives a good indication as to where the economy is headed. It's giving you a future perspective. Same with services industry. If a certain company is placing certain orders in order to give a service in the coming month, that's an indication that the business is doing well, that they have enough orders for the next month. So there is an index which tracks the extent of purchasing at the purchasing manager's level, both in manufacturing and services. This is brought out by IHS Market, which was recently acquired by S&P Global. You would have heard about Standard & Poor, which is a, a major credit rating agency in the world, right? So IHS Market is a part of S&P Global today and it brings out this important index called PMI, Purchasing Managers Index. It's a leading indicator because it's giving you an idea about the future, about the next month, how the economy is going to perform in manufacturing and services. If purchasing is higher at the purchasing manager level, it means that output will be higher, business will be better. If purchasing has gone down, it means the industries, factories, companies are expecting a lower demand for the next month. So that is how PMI becomes a leading indicator. It's giving you a futuristic idea for the next month, how the economy is going to perform. Is that clear? So according to this article, in the case of India's services sector, the PMI has jumped. It has rebounded to a three month high. This is a domestic PMI index brought out by HSBC India, but it's based on the same model, which is used by IHS market. Understood? So that is the PMI index. Next on page four, we have a very important term, which is in news. It's been referred to by India's principal scientific advisor, Ajay Kumar Sood. Ajay Kumar Sood is the principal scientific advisor to the government of India. And he has referred to a very important term called deep tech, deep tech startups. Some of you might have heard about it. So UPSC might ask you in prelims, the term deep, deep tech startups recently seen in news refers to what? Deep tech startups refers to those startups which are working in the field of research, innovation and development, which are bringing out disruptive technologies, which are working at the cutting edge of science, at the cutting edge of innovation. For example, startups working in the field of AI, artificial intelligence, startups working in the field of blockchain, startups working in robotics, such critical emerging technologies, including quantum computing. If these startups achieve a breakthrough, right, if they build more intellectual property, this could disrupt the industry. It could revolutionize the industry itself. That is the impact of these companies and the research that they are doing. So those startups are often referred to as deep tech startups. Such technology is referred to as deep tech. Now India is planning to come out with a deep tech policy. It has been recommended to the cabinet already by the principal scientific advisor. So that is why the term was in news. So please understand that deep tech refers to deep technology, which is critical emerging technology. So startups working in this domain, which are invested in innovation, research and development, which are developing intellectual property in critical emerging technologies, those startups are called deep tech startups. Whatever breakthrough they achieve will disrupt the industry, transform the industry. It will have a huge cascading effect on the economy, a positive effect on the economy. So government is encouraging such deep tech startups to focus more on research and innovation. Next, on the same page, we have an article referring to VV Pacts. I would not like to go into the article. The article itself is not too relevant because recently uh, opposition leader from the Congress party had raised concerns about the integrity of the EVMs and VV Pacts, which are used in the voting process. Right, the Election Commission of India uses the digital electronic uh, voting machines where we cast the vote. And if you have cast vote in the recent years, you'd have seen that next to your EVM machine, this is your EVM machine, next to it there is this box called VVPAT. So what is this? So the issue is in news because the Congress leader had raised questions about the integrity of these machines, but election commission has clarified that there are no concerns. The integrity of EVMs and VVPATs is well established. They can't be tampered with, they can't be meddled with, meaning elections can't be interfered with. That is how the election commission has designed the process and the machines as well. 
So while the issue itself is another issue altogether, here you should understand what are VV Pats. Does it have any kind of legal backing? See, VV Pat stands for Verifiable Voter Verifiable Paper Audit Trail. Now, when I cast my vote through an EVM machine, right? I press the the ballot button, cast a vote for my preferred candidate or party. Apart from the beep that you get, there is no confirmation. There is no guarantee. There is no acknowledgement that my vote was cast to the right person, to the right party. Right? So this always created a doubt in the minds of the voter. That did the vote get properly recorded? Because there was no acknowledgement, no proper, what do you say, uh, a proper feedback to the voter to assure the voter that the vote has been cast in the correct name of the candidate and the party that they wanted to. Apart from the beep sound, there was no other confirmation. So that is why Election Commission of India introduced a very simple novel innovation. A printing machine was added to it. VVPAT is basically a printing machine. It prints a piece of paper, right? It prints two copies of it. And you can see one copy, there is a transparent glass, you can see there whether the vote that you cast has been registered in the name of the correct candidate and the party. It stays there for a few seconds and drops into the VVPAT box. And during the counting process, this can be used for an audit. If there is a tight contest or if there are doubts about the electronic votes registered on the EVM, then VVPAT paper trails are opened and cross-checked with the electronic votes. If that matches, it means there is no foul play in that election. So it has become a critical tool in checks and balances to ensure the integrity of the elections and to provide that acknowledgement to the voter that the vote has been recorded correctly. So this has been given legal backing under Rule 49A, 49M of Conduct of Election Rules 1961. Is that clear? It was introduced by the then UPA government in 2013. And the legal validity for VVPATs is present under Conduct of Election Rules 1961. You don't have to remember the rule number. UPSC will not go into such specifics. But remember that it's given legal backing under Conduct of Election Rules of 1961. Next, article number 8. On page number 5, you find this very important article. Union Cabinet has approved a new research program called the Prithvi Program, which will be implemented under the Ministry of Earth Sciences. The Ministry of Earth Sciences is already involved in various studies related to the Earth, related to the atmosphere, related to weather and weather forecasting. For example, IMD, India Meteorological Department, is one of the institutes under the Ministry of Earth Sciences, which is responsible for weather forecasting. Right? So, Ministry of Earth Sciences studies the polar areas as well. It's involved in oceanic research. It even studies the, not just the solid earth, that is basically the lithosphere. It's involved in studying the atmosphere, the cryosphere, basically the ice covered areas, the polar areas, the glaciers, right? So earth related studies are led by the ministry. So right now there are five different streams under which studies are being carried out. So under the newly launched Prithvi program, the existing five initiatives will be clubbed. They'll be subsumed. Studies related to atmospheric observations. Studies related to oceanic research. Geosphere, study of the earth. And cryosphere, study of the polar areas and the ice capped regions. These five distinct branches of study they are being subsumed under one single program that is the Prithvi program. Prithvi refers to Earth. Study of the Earth and Earth observation is being brought under one single program with additional funding. Four, more than 4,000 crores is being set aside for Ministry of Earth Sciences to lead these various research programs. You might have recently read about India's expedition to the Antarctic, India's increased focus on Arctic research, we are planning a deep sea ocean mission where a submersible vessel will be 
will be used for research at a depth of 6,000 meters in the Indian Ocean. So all such studies, atmospheric, then oceanic, weather-based studies, earth-related studies, they'll all be subsumed under this one program, which is now being named as the Prithvi program. So please make a note of this. The other important point here in this article is about a joint satellite, a joint satellite program between India and Mauritius. Mauritius is a, a very good friend of India in the Indian Ocean. And India's ISRO has signed an agreement with the Mauritius Research and Innovation Council to develop a satellite for Mauritius. So India's ISRO will be developing a satellite for Mauritius, which might be launched by ISRO's launch vehicle as well. So that is another important point you need to note down. Now coming to the last article today on page number 11, we have an article that highlights the concerns of Nepal with regard to ongoing Russia-Ukraine war. Some of you might wonder what does Nepal have to do with Russia-Ukraine conflict? Nepal is such a small country. What does Nepal have to do with Russia-Ukraine war? With regard to the ongoing Russia-Ukraine war, Nepal has been worried because several Nepali youth have been recruited into the armies of Russia and Ukraine to fight their war. Because see, Russia especially is facing a critical shortage of soldiers. And Ukraine as well, both have announced these programs where they are offering large sums of money to attract youth from developing countries and poor countries to fight their war. And according to reports, several Nepali youth have been killed as well in the Russia-Ukraine conflict. There are few reports indicating that some Indian youth as well from Northern India, from UP Bihar, apparently have fought for Russia and Ukraine and some of them might have been missing. So this is something that really concerns the world. Because see, on one hand, we are dealing with increasing privatization of war, where big powers like US and Russia, they have relied on large private companies to run their conflicts. I'm sure you would have heard about a Russian mercenary group called Wagner Group. Right? Even US has similar private mercenaries where they recruit former soldiers and special forces uh, personnel and use them as private mercenaries to engage in their wars and conflicts. So when wars are fought with a profit motive, that itself is a rising concern, the privatization of war, the increasing usage of private mercenaries itself is very deeply concerning because they'll not be bound by international law, they'll not respect human rights and when there is a profit motive, they have an incentive to perpetuate the conflict. So while this concern is already there, the other concern which is emerging is that big powerful countries, the developed countries, powerful nations are trying to rely on, on cheap soldiers. Essentially, instead of risking their own citizens, their own soldiers, they are trying to recruit youth from poor countries and underdeveloped countries by attracting them with money. And the worst part is that they may not even have trained combat skills. They wouldn't be professional soldiers. By giving them basic minimal training, they are pushed into the war field, thus putting their lives at risk. And there is no compensation if there is loss of life, the families are not even informed. So this informal way of outsourcing the war, right? In a way, nationals of other countries are being recruited to fight the wars of other countries. So this raises new diplomatic challenges for countries like Nepal and even for India. So this is something you need to take note of. It's a trend that you need to observe and try and understand how it might impact countries like Nepal or even India. So on this note, I would like to bring my discussion to an end. Please make a note of the practice questions. I expect you to write your answers and post them in the answer writing portal for which the link is provided in the description box below. Now please head to the Telegram channel. We'll have a quiz on these articles. It'll help you revise them again. So the link for the Telegram channel can also be found in the description box below. And before I end, don't forget, we are offering one-on-one -on -one counseling to UPSC aspirants. If you're interested, all you have to do is share your details in the Google form and the link can be found in the pinned comment and in the description box below. So that is it for today. I hope you guys have enjoyed the session. Do let me know in the comments. 
I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Have a great day.